It's often said that the internet is not real life, but that isn't true. Things said online are sent by real people and received by real people, sometimes with devastating consequences. I'll uncover the dark world of cyber abuse that's affecting my life and the lives of so many others. I can't wait till you die of AIDS. I'll throw a party. Fat, ugly, cunt. Take part in scientific research investigating the risks to our mental health. Tara, are you OK, Tara? And get rare insight into what motivates trolls to send their vile messages of hate. If you are not getting any reaction from it, it's joyless. It's like smoking a cigarette without any nicotine in it. The internet is being exploited by people to shame, bully, and brutalize. And every day, it seems to be getting worse. So what are we going to do about it? Now, you, you've written from personal experience. Uh, this book uh, tells a story of you, of you being raped as a younger woman, of you being abused many times. Tell us why you've chosen to tell your own story as a kind of prism for telling the broader story. I couldn't, in all good faith, talk about the issues that are relevant for women today without mentioning sexual violence. And I couldn't mention sexual violence without putting my hand up and showing solidarity with other victims of crime. You know, to say, I'm, I'm, I'm one of you. You will get past this. This too will pass. You are brave. You are strong. And you do not need to be silent. Wasn't all applause, of course. Along with heartfelt support, abuse flooded in as soon as I turned on my phone the next morning. This is where it began for me. I remember that real life tweet arriving over my morning coffee. It wasn't the first online abuse I'd received and it certainly hasn't been the last, but it clearly marked the moment when the online trolls had decided what specific buttons to push. I'd spoken out about sexual violence, so I would receive rape threats. I would be told I should be raped or how I would be. So the online trolls were taking what they had in their twisted toolkit to try to frighten, humiliate, and intimidate. And those little razor blades sat in amongst hundreds of heartfelt messages, appearing without warning. And in this world of increasing connectivity, I'm not the only one on the receiving end. Do you have any advice, you know, to people who are coming onto Q&A uh, about being prepared for some of those public reactions? Look, we try to brief our panelists um, on that as a possibility. So we provide information to the panelists on how to use social media. You know, it, look, it's an inevitable part of democracy that if you put your head up, that, um, you know, someone might try and kick it. Kick it, or even worse. There's lots of talks about guns and, and that they've got a bullets and that they've written my name on a, on a bullet and they tell me the particular bullet. It's a nine millimetre so-and-so that they've written my name on. They're going to blast my face through my skull so it comes out the back of it. it. It's all like that. Cyber abuse is becoming so widespread. One report named 2015 as the angriest year online. So online abuse is getting worse because the proliferation of the internet has democratised trolling. This anger is impacting our everyday lives, threatening our mental health, our ability to speak out, and to have the kind of civilized public debate that is fundamental to democracy. There's a lot of evidence which shows that emotional abuse has a devastating impact on both mental and physical health, and can cause depression, anxiety, sleep problems, and even suicide. Twitter and Facebook have been around for barely a decade, and a focus on online abuse as a research topic has been even more recent. What we do know is that more than three quarters of Australians under 30 report having been abused online. Words cut and harm, and I guess if you haven't been an outsider due to your sex or your body or your race or your religion, uh, if you haven't been vilified for those things that are beyond your control, it can be a really hard thing to understand what it feels like. I mean, you know, when I, when I get abuse on Twitter, for instance, it's almost the equivalent to a stranger spitting in your face. There are two or three women that I cannot convince to come onto the show because they get such vile 
horrendous abuse online, including death threats and threats of rape that have translated into death threats that have arrived at their home, that they won't come onto the show. And that makes me so sad to think that's, that's the state of play at the moment. But that's not really Q&A. That's what exists out on Twitter. To get more of an idea of the state of cyber hate today, I caught up with Dr. Emma Jane, who is conducting one of Australia's first studies into online misogyny, cyberbullying and digital mobs. Last year, the UN released a report sort of synthesising all the data and research that's been done. And the UN found that 73% that of women and girls worldwide have experienced or witnessed online violence. So this is a really serious problem for women and girls. That said, uh, racist cyber hate, homophobic cyber hate, transphobic cyber hate, these are all really big problems as well. There are varying degrees of the types of messages that I get. Um, they range from, you know, threats of shooting me um, to, you know, kind of effing brown person, go back to where you came from. Uh, and some, I have to say, I haven't even been able to share with my husband. They are just so vile that even repeating them does distress me. One of the reasons why these guys raid my Facebook page all the time and leave these horrible messages and dreadful like pictures, memes, cruel pornography, like the most disgusting kind of stuff you can imagine, is because they're trying to drive my followers away from me and disrupt my ability to influence anyone or communicate a message. And that's certainly what we're dealing with when we're looking at those kind of troll attacks and that organised cyber violence, that tribalism and that gang mentality. House for a year or so. Women never Dr. Jane's research and her own experience points to an alarming escalation of violent abuse online, including rape threats and graphic, sexually violent speech aimed at women and girls. She calls this new language of abuse rape glitch. Dr. Jane read to me the first rape glitch message she received. What is your agenda? Girl power? To hate men? Or just being your stupid self? You should have a good ass fuck lasting two hours every day. That would set you right. You look like a tart, desperate for cock. Or maybe you think you're cool or funky. All feminists should be gang raped to set them right. Plus work in a whorehouse for a year or so. Women never had voting rights through history of mankind and should not have it now either. So there we have, um, we have this idea that coerced sex is, you know, offered as some kind of corrective. The cock corrective. Yeah, existentially, it gives me a huge crisis to think, oh my God, there's all these dudes out there that actually think this stuff. What do you think are some of the myths around cyber hate and online abuse? So a lot of people will say to me, that's oh, just words, just shut off. What kind of stuff do you hear? I hear the same types of things. I absolutely don't accept, firstly, that, that online life is different to real life. The network is completely integrated into everyday life. And as for the idea that it's just simply a matter of unplugging your modem, you know, and taking a bit of a break from the internet, which is what police have told almost all the women I've interviewed who've gone to try and get police help. To me, that is on par with saying, just stay inside for a while. Don't go out into public life and it goes further than victim blaming, it's victim punishing. Yeah, it matters to me what happens online and what happens online to me has an impact and switching it off just isn't an option. Going back to Q&A and speaking with Dr. Jane has reinforced my belief that we can't simply tell people to ignore the abuse they're getting as if it's that easy. We can't leave the internet to the bullies, especially when their words and actions can cause such devastation. Speaking out and participating in democracy has always brought some criticism with it. After all, it's not real debate without disagreement. But has the internet created a space for more constructive debate or simply more abuse? 
Is it too easy to abuse others from behind a keyboard? We're here at Speaker's Corner, which was established in 1878. You could say it's a 138-year-old precursor to social media. But here, it's face-to-face. -face. There's no hiding behind keyboards. Repeal the laws of sexual harassment. So I want that it's not a crime, so sexual harassment's not a crime. So it's the women's want... fault if they get sexually harassed, it's the women's fault. No, it's not the women's fault. The idea that a woman can't stick up for herself we're perpetuating, as we have for centuries, this idea that she needs protection. Sexual harassment laws aren't saying that women can't protect themselves. It says that there's a legal recourse when someone has committed a crime against you. It's just like with issues like sexual assault or abuse. You go, hey, it's not that the person can't stick up for themselves. It's that a perpetrator has committed a crime. All right, well, I'm changing my mind. <laughs> Straight on. <laughs> I wonder if Mark and I would have reached agreement so civilly on social media, where it seems the normal rules of debate don't apply. Part of the problem, as I see it, is there's still a perception that because we are online, sometimes anonymously, it's just words, and words on their own have no power. But is that really true? I was really good friends um, with Charlotte Dawson, who was one of the most gorgeous women I've ever met. Look at what words did to her. You know, they broke her in the end. The Australian entertainment world is paying tribute to the television identity Charlotte Dawson, who's been found dead in her Sydney apartment. The 47-year-old former model was hospitalised in 2012 after extreme abuse and bullying online. Charlotte Dawson's very public battle against her online abusers should stand as testimony to the dangers of cyber hate. Yet despite the many cases in recent years where online abuse has been named as a significant factor in suicide and self-harm in everyone from children to high-profile people like Charlotte, some people still doubt the potency of written words. Research shows us that emotional and physical pain activate similar brain regions. So I volunteered to take part in an experiment conducted at Neura, a world leader in brain and nervous system research. Dr. Sylvia Gustin has been using brain imaging techniques and psychological assessment to investigate chronic pain for the past 19 years. A lot of people think that words can't harm you. But this is actually not true. With this experiment today, we would like to show that words can have a huge impact on our brain. All right, so tell me what's going to happen. I would like to do a functional MRI experiment today with you. And I'm interested what is going on in your brain while you're exposed to threatening words and sentences. Mm -hmm. So you will lie on this bed in the MI machine and your head will be fixated in a special coil. And I will project violent words and sentences on the screen. You seem like such a nice person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's an experiment. All right, well, let's see how it goes. I will now project the cross on your screen and please focus on the cross and try to make your mind blank. Everything okay? All good, thank you. So she's focusing her attention to the cross and we see very little brain activations. So Tara, now I will project the violent sentence onto your screen. Please focus on these words and observe your upcoming emotions and thoughts and think about what these words mean to you. The violent message put to screen was a tweet I'd received after speaking out on Q&A and showing solidarity with other survivors of sexual assault. I believe the personalized abuse struck a chord, even though I had received and read it before and the words were therefore familiar. Taran. Are you okay, Taran? After nearly an hour in the MRI, alternately trying to clear my mind and being shown abuse I'd received, I was mentally exhausted. I felt really under threat, and Sylvia did explain that I was going to be reading some of the abusive material I've received online. 
But even though I know those words already and she's not actually threatening me, I still felt under threat. My body felt under threat. On your end, what did you learn? What, what did you see happening in my brain? We have seen brain activation here, a lot of perfusion. So that means that your brain cells were very active. When we suppress feelings and thoughts, they actually get stronger in our mind. They get stronger in our brain. They're more present. And this is the reason we have seen this increase in activity in your brain, in emotional brain processing areas, such as the anterior cingulate cortex, mm -hmm. that's here. And then another area which we have seen was the insula. And these areas are actually emotional brain processing areas. They are activated when you are in fear or you have emotional feelings. But the problem is that you can't stop these emotions mm. because they are so strong and mm. therefore you can see this overactivity is going on and going on and going on. So trying to block our feelings and thoughts can make them even stronger. And what is even more alarming, Dr. Gustin's research shows that sustained emotional abuse can alter levels of stress hormones and even kill brain cells. And this can have devastating effects on brain function. Because it can change the structure, the function and the biochemistry of our brain, resulting in mental health disorders such as depression and anxiety. So it is really important that we work with it, that we process it and we don't deny it. My body was reacting like it was in pain and that's, um, that's really something to absorb. There's no doubt that I was quite adrenalized and certainly my heart rate apparently went through the roof, but I don't think I really realized the extent of that until someone like Sylvia was able to explain to me, your body has just gone through an assault. That's, that's far out. So I experienced an attack of sorts. As far as my brain was concerned, those words had just as much impact as if I was experiencing an assault in a real world context. So is this assault in the eyes of the law? What's legal and what isn't online? We have a, a series of laws in Australia, really quite strong laws, that prohibit kind of abusive conduct. So there's one law that makes it an offence, a criminal offence, all around Australia, to use the internet to menace, harass or cause offence. So the law exists, it's just not enforced in any sort of routine or effective way. So what do you think of the rise of digital antiism? Is it surprising that users are taking the abusers into their own hands and outing them and trying to take action in ways that aren't using the authorities. I think it's really interesting because it, it's not surprising because nothing else has worked so far. That when people take these kinds of threats to the authorities, the authorities are often not responsive enough. And there's no easy way to actually tackle abuse online. We don't have the tools to do it. So we're seeing people try to take this into their own hands in a way that you know flips the tables on the people who are uh, sending out the abuse. I think now social media platforms have to recognise there's a phenomenon particularly of women who are in public life who are subjected to targeted hate campaigns in which their lives are threatened, violence is threatened against them. All these things should be legally actionable. I should be able to phone somebody and go, this is happening, this person is harassing me, look at their account, this is a person who does not belong in the community. And that, that should be enough to get them kicked off. And when I say kicked off, I mean their IP addresses tracked and complaints made with the police. That's the kind of assistance that we need from the platforms. So where's the line between sort of free speech, censorship, what's appropriate and what is inappropriate online? One of the big problems is this is not a democracy. The social spaces we inhabit online are owned private spaces. So the platforms that regulate these spaces, they have conflicting incentives. They might want to encourage freedom of speech. They might want to create safe spaces for people to communicate, but they definitely want to sell advertising. There's been a lot of promises that the social media platforms will do more to combat abuse, but they've failed pretty miserably so far. So, if we can't rely on the platforms to protect us, we need to know how to protect ourselves. But before we do that, we need to look at how systematic harassment and abuse became so prolific, how the abusers operate and what motivates them. Personally, I hate the use of the word troll to describe people who abuse others online. Trolls are mythical creatures who live under bridges. 
But these are real people we're talking about, and they're abusing other real people online. I think there's a difference between someone who's just plain annoying and irritating and an actual troll. A troll is someone who's going to go for you hard. They're going to get personal and it's ugly. They don't actually want to have a discussion or even a debate. They just really want to get you and it becomes really personal and pretty toxic. Anyone can abuse. For me, trolling requires a bit more thought. For problem solving aspect, you know, how can we get under this person's skin or this group's skin? Some of the most beautiful trolls are ones where it's so obvious that it's a trap and, and that someone is just taking a piss, but they buy in anyway. Those are the sweetest ones. For some more insights, I contacted Dr. Emma Jane, whose groundbreaking research into online misogyny was prompted by her own experiences, receiving violent cyber hate while working as a journalist. What do we know about who the trolls actually are? What we do know is that back in the earlier days of the internet, there were groups of subcultural sort of trolls lurking around sites like 4chan. Now, these guys develop a fairly sexist and racist and homophobic style of humour that I think has caught on in the mainstream community. So those early trolls were also very big on the image macros that we see today. So the funny pictures with the funny words on the top. Yeah. That was their kind of humour. What about some of the things we're seeing now, like digital mobs? So those kinds of group activities that involved mean humour progressed and mutated to what we have today where we can see a, a massive cyber mobs develop with extraordinary speed and, and they can attack with extraordinary viciousness so that the person on the other end of these attacks can be just totally overwhelmed by this tsunami of you know hate coming from literally all over the world. In the online world, it's called a pylon. So what they would do is get all their trolling mates and pile on this person. And sometimes the results were really devastating. So for example, one of the worst trolls that I came across, he told me that he and his trolling mates often tried to incite people to suicide and they would find particularly vulnerable people and set about doing that. Journalist Ginger Gorman is one of the few people to have spoken to trolls about their motivations. There's research suggesting that people engage in this kind of abusive online behavior are often sadistic and psychopathic, and it seems they actually agreed. So the research out of the University of Manitoba and British Columbia in Canada suggests that trolling is very strongly correlated with the dark tetrad of personality traits. So as you just said, psychopathy, Machiavellianism, narcissism, and sadism. But sadism is a very strong link. Almost all of them said, definitely, I'm a sadist. The other amazing thing to me was the narcissistic factor. So the trolls I spoke to really wanted to let me know how they hurt and humiliated other people, and they wanted to tell the world about that. And yeah, one of them even said, yes, I'm a psychopath. So it's strange because in a sense, they have a self-reflection about that. They understand that. They're not deluded about what they're doing at all or what motivates them. Now, you interviewed a particularly vicious online abuser that we're going to call Mark. Yep. Someone found me on Facebook. So Mark started trolling people. Facebook memorial pages at the age of 14, and he loved the pain he could cause the family members of the person who had died. So, for example, he might go onto the wall of a young girl who died by suicide and say that she couldn't handle the shame of being such an immense slut any longer. You get a feeling of enjoyment and power over causing their family members distress and pain and anger. That is vile. And then eventually other trolls found him. He joined an incredibly powerful trolling gang. He's very high up in that trolling gang and he gets a lot of power and a lot of satisfaction from that role. So, yeah, there were some points where I found it quite difficult. I wanted to press on, though, because I think if we know who trolls are and we know what they want, then that gives us a power. What makes you choose what you say in that online forum? Um, I'm, well, before I say anything, I'm going to like study the people involved, know what would offend them, and then I'm just going to choose the most offensive thing I can think of to that audience. 
And what's going through your head when you're doing that? What's going through my head? Oh, I'm just hoping to get a good reaction out of them, really. So that was a bit of an epiphany for you, wasn't it? It certainly was, because when you yourself are being trolled, it hurts so much. It feels so personal. But what Mark has just told us is that it isn't about you. It could be anything. When they choose a victim, they research the victim and they look for the weakest point. So in fact, it's like business for them. And once I knew that, I just knew that I could throw it off. The power's gone because he just laid out the game plan. So we know what he wants. And I don't give it to trolls anymore. I just don't respond at all. But as women, I think it's really important that we don't take this as being silenced. We keep talking, we keep doing whatever it is we were doing before. It's just that we don't react to the trolls. As we've just heard from Ginger, these kinds of online abusers are strategic. They want to find your weakest point and attack. Two people who have received a lot of strategic, very personal abuse are writer and activist Van Batam and comedian Joel Creasy. On the day of my father's funeral, and let's just contextualise this, my father was my best friend. Uh, an online troll sent violent porn to my account with the caption, this is what your father thought of you. And it was the day of his funeral and the viciousness of that comment was amazing and it went on and on and on and the troll kept continuing and was trying to sort of incite that with other people. And I remember looking at it just thinking, you know Van, if you can survive this, you can survive anything. It cannot get worse than this. What about you, Joel? Is it an incident that stands out for you? The Orlando Pulse nightclub shooting, someone said, you know, I wish you, you'd been there. Just out of nowhere, that came up on my Twitter. I wish you'd been, I wish you'd been at the club that night. Online abuse, including death threats, impacts people across the political spectrum. One Australian conservative who has been subjected to death threats is Andrew Bolt. He writes a weekly column and blog and hosts The Bolt Report. You did speak out about threats to your family that caused you to move house. Can yes. you tell us about that? Well, there were a number of threats by a person with, uh, who had bikey colours on his um, web page and, and was threatened to, you know, I'm out to get you now. There'd been a long stream of abuse from the sky that had steadily ratcheted up over a year or two and, and then they started getting quite specific. I'm coming, you know, so that's something I don't want to subject my children to. No. So do you think there's a, a kind of public discourse that has turned more violent in recent years? Look, it's true, Tara. I mean, you know, in a sense you think, well, what, what has changed? Because, you know, there are crazies always been with us. Yeah. Right? Um, except, of course, there's a legitimising influence now, but not just by the form of technology, as in the more clicks you get by being brutal, the more you're affirmed. Mm -hmm. that's, that's bad enough. Before you'd send, you know, mail out a letter to uh, doing a threat and you'd hear nothing. And, you know, you wouldn't get anything, you'd be into a void. Now, click, 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 click. But here's the problem. I mean, it, it goes back to, there are so many people writing nasty things. They're sitting in their underpants late at night, half tanked or stoned, and they write, F you and I'm gonna get you, and then they go to bed like that. Um, how can you distinguish between that person and the one who really is coming to get you? I'm really troubled by a lot of what I've been hearing in terms of the extent to which people are abused, um, the levels that abusers will go to to try to find people's homes, to threaten their families as they systematically seek out their target's weakest point. You know, I knew a lot of this stuff before we started doing this, but it is an area where I can continue to be shocked. This is someone we'll call Craig. He's been part of a global trolling network. For the very few online abusers who have gone on the record, we have to keep in mind that we shouldn't take everything they say absolutely at face value. This is because a lot of people who identify as online trolls actually bend the truth to suit themselves, and that can be part of the game. So please keep this in mind during the next interview. As I don't interact with known trolls, my co-producer conducted this interview. Should we believe what you say? I've got no reason to lie about this. I'm taking enough of a risk by doing the interview in the first place, you know? I'd ask viewers to, to sniff it out and, and ask if, if this coincides with their reality. Uh, I think the term troll does apply to me, but I, I would consider myself a pure troll. 
a troll, you know, who did something for at least most of the time a purpose. Why the disguise? I've had to appear um, in disguise because, you know, I have a life, I have a career. I'm absolutely terrified of someone outing me, but I wanted to provide a balancing point to this topic and hopefully get people thinking a bit more deeply about what is trolling and what is the nature of online abuse, what can we do about it, um, and what are the drivers of it. I think a lot of it comes down to boredom, loneliness, quite easy path to slip into and probably better things I can be doing with my time. Trolling has been linked with psychopathy, Machiavellianism, narcissism and sadism, known as the dark tetrad. Does this apply to you? I really like the sound of the dark tetrad. It sounds like a character out of a Dungeons and Dragons game. <laughs> Psychopathy, no, I'm not a psychopath. You need to be calculating, so I guess that would be the, the Machiavellian um, aspect of that. I'm incredibly narcissistic. In terms of sadism, no, no, I don't think so. I don't want to ruin people's lives. There are some trolls I've met who are, um, oh, they, they, you know, they have some, some very scary worldviews and some very um, scary patterns of behaviour towards other people. Who do you target? I go after people who are wealthy, self-absorbed, people with a profile. And the attraction there is, I guess, a bit of its revenge. These people are self-promoters. They're very much into themselves. A lot of them, I think, have pretty poor politics. So for me, the attraction of baiting and abusing someone who's um, got some profile and who's wealthy. Do you think words have impact? Absolutely. Words do have effect. And regardless of whether you say them online or you say them in person, they still do mean something. Clearly, Craig understands the power of words in the online world, but many others don't. It's called the online disinhibition effect. And what it really means is that social norms don't apply. So whereas somebody would never come up to me in real life and say, I'm going to rape you and cut out your uterus or I'm going to kill your children, they somehow feel able to do this online. To demonstrate online disinhibition, we asked volunteers to read real tweets and comments received online by writer and activist Van Batum and comedian Joel Creasy. Hello, thank you for volunteering today. This is Joel Creasy. Hey, okay, nice to Hello. meet you. This is Van Batum. Hello. <laughs> Hi. You're going to be reading some material to him yep. that he's received online. No. I don't want you to flip this over and have a look until we're ready to begin. Okay. Joel Creasy, you are gay. That's it. You're not funny, Joel Creasy. Fuck off already. Don't take this personal, but frankly, you're everything a woman should not be. Try being a lady and you'll find life more enjoyable. First of all, she's a feminist, so a giant fuck you. Hey, look, guys. It's that fat, ugly cunt from The Guardian. You're a cancer to progressive society. You have no integrity and I can't blame the people who threaten you. That's, yeah, that's brutal stuff. Um. That's the whole point, is to get the reaction. If you are not getting any reaction from it, it's joyless. It's like smoking a cigarette without any nicotine in it. So you need to know what they like and what they don't like, what they're afraid of, what they hate, and you need all those things, and you hope you get your desired reaction out of them that way. Imagine waking up every day and having to be Joel Creasy. I couldn't think of anything worse. I wish you had been at the Pulse nightclub the night of the shooting. I can't wait till you die of AIDS. I'll throw a party. I'll smack the bitch in the mouth. I'd do it to a guy and equal rights means I can do it to a girl. Do us a favour and stop breathing. It's all right, I'm not holding you responsible. No, it's no, <laughs> I know, it's just, yeah. Face the facts. You are all sluts. And no one gives a rat's ass about you, Vanessa bad pig. So fuck off and be fat somewhere else. Yeah, just, yeah, horrible, I mean. I wasn't homophobic until I saw Joel Creasy, but now I want to move to Uganda because you can kill gay people there. You know, it, it just proves that, you know, it was uncomfortable for them. Mm. And uh, so as if anyone would do that in person, that's how, that's how weak these people that do it online are. I've said before today that I really worry that I'm getting so used to it that I won't pick up a threat. Mm. But realistically as well, like I wander around just not knowing what's going to happen and having this sort of adrenalised sense of danger all the time. 
Yeah, I could just feel the weight of those words. And I think every single person who left this studio had those words kind of draped on them. Uh, I felt quite bad actually making them say that stuff or have to hear it. So I think the argument that it's just words is really, it's pretty hard to back up. Words do have weight. Yeah, fuck, that's hectic. As we've just seen, online spaces seem to encourage a lack of inhibition without the sense of consequences that are normally present in face-to-face -face interactions. And when that disinhibition meets mob mentality, the potential harm can multiply exponentially. So I have been involved in some trolling groups. It's something that I'm not proud of because I just stood back and watched while they did these horrible things and the rampant racism that, you know, and anti-Semitism and sexism and, you know, I think just by being around them, we're enabling them. Mariam Vesede has faced organised, systematic mob abuse. The majority of the cyberbullying actually started um, when a group called United Patriots Front. They were targeting me online and they'd taken something I'd said about uh, this Woolies t-shirt saga. Kind of if you don't like Australia, go home or something That's right. similar. It was yeah. um, love it or leave on a t-shirt carrying a picture of the Australian flag and um, I added my voice to a chorus of voices that day that were in opposition to the idea that an iconic brand like Woolies um, would be seeking to endorse it. It was literally one tweet that was then mischievously cropped by the United Patriots Front in other hate pages at the time. And then it was posted on their Facebook page urging their 5,000 plus followers to start to start harassing me. And that's really when I noticed there was just a barrage of abuse. I guess it's the triple whammy for me, that the intersection between race, religion and, and gender. The, the nature of what I'm seeing, not only is Islamophobic in nature, there's references to my ethnicity, so bringing race into it, but also misogynist undertones as well to some of the messages that I'm seeing. I've, yeah, I've seen pretty much everything, but I mean, the first time you see it, it's just, it's quite shocking and has an impact. Do you think they're working in concert together, a lot of these abusers, to try to, you know, try to push your buttons, to try to go further, to try to, to what, ultimately silence you? That is actually their stated objective. There's been sophisticated hacking websites that have weighed into the, the discussion, you know, people that are completely anonymous and untraceable, talking about willing to pay to locate my address. I've had my work details published online, I've had my phone number, I've received abusive SMSs, abusive phone calls. I've had uh, bacon mailed to an old residential address, which was just bizarre. And I think the thing is, I've come to a point where I can't, I can't underestimate um, the threat because often when I've ignored it or assumed that it was just internet chatter, they've actually gone ahead and, and, and done what they said they were going to do. It's uncomfortable to step into the mindset of someone out to intentionally harm others. But whether or not we can believe everything said at absolute face value, I do believe we've gained some genuine insights. There seems to be an array of motivations for this behaviour. For some it's boredom and revenge, misogyny, racism and homophobia. And there are those who believe that what they do is not only free speech, it's an essential part of liberty. Freedom of speech isn't just about saying whatever you think and assuming that people need to put up with it, whether it's really racist or sexist or I don't know, homophobic or whatever else. It's about actually being able to convey your thoughts in a way that can contribute to some constructive discussion and debate in society. I'm one of those people who don't care about freedom of speech. I think it's a crock of shit. Freedom of speech is a right that allows wealthy people to say what they want because what they always have in return is defamation. But what freedom of speech allows, I guess, is for um, people to say what is the unsayable. The internet was once trumpeted as a democratic space for free speech, but this is now at risk because of systematic abuse and harassment. Andrew Bolt has become a lightning rod for the discussion of freedom of speech in Australia. Some people do caution that corporations and governments will use online abuse as an excuse to censor free speech. Is that a concern of yours? Well, uh, any kind of censorship is, is is a concern of mine and don't forget the rules of censorship both in terms of law and how it's then applied by judges is essentially uh, decisions of the powerful 
uh, applying to the not powerful, the voiceless quite often. It's done with the best of intentions and to the public good. But sometimes the confusion is that what a certain social group, powerful social group, deems acceptable or unacceptable speech is not what the mass may uh, think or those that don't have aren't members of the club and we need to be very careful about that. While there were things we agreed on, in truth, Andrew and I did not have the easiest interview. I mean, a lot of people would describe your blogs as being controversial. Would you yeah, agree not, with we, that? We, we, I consider your views controversial. Do you? But I'm fascinated that I'm controversial. I kind of no, like no, that. And I did mention what is sometimes known as the Bolt Army, supporters and readers of Andrew Bolt who harass people online who are mentioned in his blogs and columns. With the Bolt Army and this and I'm always... But I'm wondering what you would then say to readers who engage in that sort of behaviour, because it's certainly not only it. your readers. I don't readers. encourage it, I don't uh, set it off, and I don't mm. endorse it. If there are people that read something, they react to it, and, they, and they, uh, so they're critical, that's perfectly fine. And I get heaps of it. I get worse, I'd say I get worse than any one of the critics get. But ab abuse is different. Debate is important for democracy, but no matter what end of the political spectrum you're on, the line must be drawn at malicious abuse and the intention to harm, and most importantly, threats of violence. But in the meantime, how do we protect ourselves from abuse and predators like Craig? Don't be lazy with your social media habits. So have a separate password for every single social media account. That way, it means that if you get into one, you can't just go into every single other and basically steal someone's online identity. And in terms of protecting yourself from just the general abuse, my advice is don't feed the trolls, don't get into arguments with them because that's what they crave. And if people start making threats, you need to go to the police and at least have it reported. While I'm a writer by trade, I'm also a human rights advocate and an anti-cyberbullying campaigner. And as this issue of online abuse has worsened, impacting more everyday people, I've written books and articles on the subject and also spoken at numerous schools so that more people can know their rights and their options when they're faced with this kind of abuse, whether it's from complete strangers or someone they know. So from my research and my experience, these are my top tips for managing internet safety. Report abusive and threatening content to the social media service and consider reporting it to the police. The more we report serious online abuse, the more likely we are to create a safer environment for everyone. I think it's only by standing up against um, trolls and uh, exposing what they say that we can change societal attitudes and mindsets. Collect evidence. Only you can decide whether to report abuse online, but if you do, you're gonna want screenshots, and you're probably gonna also want URLs showing where the abuse is happening and when. It is important to take um, the, the threats seriously. When there are uh, believable threats made against you, it's important for law enforcement agencies to take a role in protecting you from potential physical abuse in these cases. Think twice about engaging online or posting a particular item, whether that's because it's about yourself or someone else. It might impact their privacy or your own. It's going to stay there, so you need to be able to stand behind it and also realise that um, others aren't always going to be kind about what you share online. Use the block and mute buttons. In the physical world, a person wouldn't be expected to stand and take abuse from a stranger on the street. You don't have to take abuse from strangers online either. They are looking for your weakest point. So once you know that, you know that giving them a response is what they want. So be silent to the trolls. But this doesn't mean be silenced. Good digital hygiene, as it's sometimes called, can also help. This means balancing screen time with real-world interactions and activities. Many people who are prominent online take days off, usually the weekends, where they don't log on and they don't check social media. And when I use social media, personally, I make sure that I use it in common spaces of the house, not private spaces, my bedroom or bath or areas like that, one of the reasons is because violent threats online usually come completely without warning. And you need that psychological buffer, that, that sort of division between your private world and your public space. We also need to support those who have the courage to call out online abuse. A few years ago, my friend Carly Findlay, who lives with a genetic skin disorder ichthyosis, had her picture misappropriated on the platform Reddit. 
So I woke up one day to a lot of hits on my blog and I wondered why there were so many hits. And I looked at my stats and all this traffic came from Reddit and I thought, oh God, because the Reddit forums are notorious for mocking and ridiculing people with differences, with disabilities, facial differences, medical conditions. And my photo was used on the what the fuck forum. And there were about, at that stage there were about 200 comments and some of them were, um, what does her vagina look like? Um, she looks like something my dog chewed up, um, that I'm a lobster, and that, I mean that was a mild one, um, and that I should be killed with fire. Horrible. Yeah. One of your comments on the Reddit thread I thought was really powerful, I'll just read it quickly. Mm -hmm. I knew the day would come that someone would create a Reddit thread about me using my photo, having a laugh at my appearance. Mm -hmm. For years, that fear was why I didn't share photos of me online. Yep. But now, after gaining confidence and support through years of blogging, I couldn't care whether they call me a lobster or silly putty. <laughs> it's, um, I think you turned that thread around beautifully and really managed to educate a lot of people. Would yeah. you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of them said, I came here to laugh, but now I'm educated. And I think it really demonstrates the power of using your own voice. <laughs> so where do we go from here? Like, how do we make online spaces more positive. You know, we can't stop, we can't back down and we can't shut up because of these people. You know, um, I'm not going to stop writing about disability, ableism and, um, you know, appearance diversity issues because they're always out there. I'm not going to hide my face for fear that I'm going to be shown on Reddit. Is we got to do it together. Yeah. It would be a real shame if people like Carly were bullied out of public discourse by abuse. We need more voices like Carly's, not less. We can't let the online abusers silence the already marginalized and the different. And what about the next generation? What can we do to make online spaces safer for them? Some say the abstinence model is best, but is keeping kids away from this kind of technology helpful or even realistic? Is there another way to think about empowering the next generation? I hope we get better at, at handling the web. It is new technology. It's a little bit like the, the motor car. When the motor car was first really popularised in the 1950s, we allowed it to dominate our cities. We, we dug up cities. We put expressways through LA and Sydney and London. Whatever the car wanted to do, the car got to do. We were so in love with it. And I hope that we have a sophisticated enough understanding of the net in the end to understand it's quite similar. We don't want the technology itself to, to choose its own path, to destroy everything um, that it comes across. And we have to work hard to try as individuals and as a society to get the good out of the net without all the really negative consequences. I think the abstinence model is probably 10 or 15 years out of date as a viable solution because kids don't just go online these days. They live their lives online. It's the way they engage, the way they entertain themselves uh, and the way they communicate with their friends. Andre Wright is the Acting eSafety Commissioner. She leads the Government Office for Online Safety and Education. Recently, we've done a survey with parents and 90% of them have told us that they think their kids being online are positive. They do want to know how to manage the risks. One of the biggest risks is online bullying. When we have been bullied as a child, this is a very stressful and extremely negative experience which can alter the structure, function, biochemistry of the brain, resulting in mental health disorders. And these brain changes might develop faster and might stay longer. There was research done by the government in 2014 which showed uh, roughly 20% of children between about 8 and 17 are cyberbullied in any 12-month period. And this was an Australian first, to, or a world first, to decide that there needed to be somewhere that they could go. There would be a point of contact who could work with social media companies to have quick remedies uh, to get uh, the bullying images removed. In addition to all the cyber safety education that's happening at schools, we need to introduce the ethics of online engagement. So it's not just about risk and safety, it's also about ethics and civility. It's the oldest idea in the world, empathy, but it seems to have been trodden totally underfoot. Imagine how it feels to 
receive these messages, whether you're somebody on the media or whether you're a fellow 14-year-old kid at school. I feel like the people that are, you know, in charge of the discussions are of an older generation who don't understand, you know, who ask where the space bar is. But I guess hopefully my generation can sort it out because that's our strength, the online world. I'm here at the annual Our Watch Awards for excellence in media reporting and social media activism to end violence against women and girls, including online abuse. And the winner is Sarah Ferguson, Niall Fulton, Ivana Mahoney, Kylie Gray, and Philippa Rowlands. On this one night of the year, some of the most trolled activists and writers in Australia are under one roof to celebrate the small victories. And maybe we shouldn't underestimate the importance of that. Sometimes it's supportive communities, acknowledgement from your peers, and the little victories that keep you going. Paloma Brearley Newton and Olivia Melville were up for an award for best use of social media as part of the team from Sexual Violence Won't Be Silenced. They are a Sydney-based advocacy group that combats gendered and sexual harassment online. The work that we do um, is like centered a lot around education and um, sort of allowing people to understand what their rights are online and um, what you can and can't do. But recently we had this guy that used to post on every single post that we did on Facebook basically saying how we were the worst people in the entire world and we were trying to make, take away freedom of speech. And then one day I was just checking our Facebook for no apparent reason when I was bored and I saw a comment come up and I went to read it and it literally was from this guy and it said, I've been posting really horrible things to you for the past three months and I just wanted to apologize. Everything that I said was horrible. I understand now where you're coming from. And if we don't make radical change, just to change one person's mind, just stop that one person from writing really vile things on our Facebook wall, to make that one person realize that their actions kind of had power and that perhaps it was hurting someone at the, under, the other end of the internet. It was huge. I guess that's what we're all about. Like, we're all about incremental change. Paloma is right. It is about incremental change. And there's no one thing that will stop the epidemic of online abuse. It will take a lot of changes, small and large, by a lot of people. So, where to next? My suggestion is, in fact, to go back to something our grandmas used to say to us, which is, if you can't say something nice, don't say it at all. I'm not saying don't disagree with people, I'm just saying act like it's real life because there is a person at the other end of that computer or smartphone. The more of us who stand up, the more things will change. Societal change, unfortunately, doesn't happen with a magic wand. We have to work hard at it and we have to change people's minds. You know, I wish I had the confidence of so many big government, big you know, society reformers of the left and the right, that one change of the law and everyone's civil or different or nice and all that kind of thing. It doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, it's a long cultural shift that's needed. And I think we need to start holding people to account more. If I could magically affect one change in the online world, it would be accountability. Use your real name and your real face. I think I really, really wish that we could engage in discussion where there is a real genuine intention to understand what the other person is saying. Everyone is all too ready to fire a reply and, you know, to the vitriol is just all too common, but the ability to really digest what you are being told and reply with an intention to understand doesn't happen. We've spoken to a lot of experts and high-profile people about cyber hate, but what are your thoughts? I took to Facebook to get your views. Have you experienced online abuse? How do you think we can make online spaces better and safer? The response was heartfelt and courageous. I received cyber hate for two years. After the stillbirth of my second child, you don't deserve a healthy a baby. A friend of a friend decided to tell me I deserve to be raped. One common theme was that of solidarity and determination in the face of abuse. Many shared their stories of refusing to stay silent about abuse. I meet all abuse with naming their behaviour. I pretty much always report and block them. 
people are always looking for other people they can take out their own insecurities on. I'm sorry you experienced this too, and so glad you block and report. As we've seen throughout the series, the trolls and abusers use a myriad of excuses, and a lack of consequences has only emboldened them. We need to bring online abuse into the open, like we have with other forms of abuse and violence. Thank you for your efforts. Online abuse is a huge topic. This is something that impacts people of all genders and all backgrounds. I've certainly learned a lot on this journey, and I think that more than ever, it's really difficult to argue that what happens online doesn't have real-world consequences. It's clear that it does. I still strongly believe that the positives of being online outweigh the negatives. There's no one silver bullet here. There's no one single thing that's gonna fix these issues, but surely acknowledging that this is real is a start. There should be and are consequences for online actions. And when we accept that, I think we can move towards online spaces that are more civil and more democratic. <laughs>